Hey, mm-hmm. you thinking about having a baby? That takes nine months. <laughs> Let's do something different. <laughs> you're talking about Let's the R- have a sexy body baby. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the RGB bundle. That's what I'm talking Nine about. Nine months of exercise programming or the MAPS super bundle, which also includes on top of that. But I want everything though. MAPS Anywhere and MAPS Prime. Two of Both those bundles have most of our programs. The super bundle has all of our programs. And this month only, enroll in one of those and you get... What do you get for free? I think you get everything else for free. No right? BS six pack abs, nutrition survival guide, and the fasting guide, and the forum for fifty percent off all come when you get either one of those. Yep. So for free, no BS six pack formula, nutrition guide, fasting guide for free, and the forum for fifty percent off. It's at mindpumpmedia.com. You're set for the year. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Dude, you got rid of the mustache. Yeah. Huh? You got rid of the mustache. You know what happened? <clears throat> what happened? So I need to buy, because I really enjoy growing uh, facial hair, a long, long facial hair. Um, but what happened was, is I have a beard trimmer that I only have like, the short guard on Did you it. You just go off the rails or what? Well, what ha- I have the short guard, right? So mm. it's not the long guard where I can like gauge it properly. Next time, let me help you, dude. So my like, if you fuck it up, you, you know, we can help? make some like cool like brick you you know, designs you in your face. You help me? You so help me so, what? I explain. so I go, so I go so my daughter lightning like, bolts. My daughter's like, I papa, I hate it. it's too long. I hate it. You make it cleaner. Ah, she's like complaining, right? And my daughter's like, come on, I'm gonna do whatever she tells me. So I go in the bathroom. And I'm like, I'm going to trim this up. I'm going to clean it up so that my little girl, she thinks her dad's handsome again. So I go and I fucking, because the guard is too short, and I fucking went too short on one side. So it was either. Bro, you got to like use like scissors. It was either go in, go like, okay, just deal with it and just have one side short and the other. Or I had to just even everything out. So So you don't. So I, when I, when I trim like the mustache, I don't actually take a guard to that. Mm-hmm. You take the guard off and actually just line your lip. So you go ahead and let the top hair like continue. Is to it grow. bad that I use nose hair trimmers to do that? To do what? Nose like, hair? How do you do that, bro? It's like this little. I'll bring it in. It's like this little tiny version. It probably actually, of that, right? it probably works like, really good. Yeah. Oh, it's the little. It's uh, a little one. It's yeah. the little uh, buzzer. I have, I have one. I have one of those for my my butthole. ear, my ear, yeah. and my nose. Yeah, that was for your butt. I take care of. God, God, you could sound use it old as fuck now. I never thought I'd ever have to use that shit. You know what? Yeah. You just said something. That <laughs> yeah. just, you know, what just reminded me. What? I just noticed this. Not making this up. Like a week ago, dude. I'm looking in the mirror. This is a fucking frightening thing for a man. Now, there's two things that are quite frightening. Three things that are very frightening for a man. White uh, pubic one, hair. White pubic hair. Yes, very fucking frightening. F- yeah. terrifying. Lose your hair on your head. That mm. sucks. Adam will tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> or three. Or three. Hair growing from your ear. What? Oh, in yeah. your ear. Why? Yeah. Oh my god. You're I don't like get a wolf it. man. What is going like, on? We evolve into wolf people. But what's the evolutionary fucking advantage no of that shit? Dude, my nose hair grows more than anything else now. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's just like this bush that just like, it just forms and I start breathing and you notice it. It's like, <laughs> like what in the fuck? And there's just big old tarantulas in there. I, I get hate rid of it. Them. Yeah. yeah. It's stupid. It is. It's stupid. Ah, what are you guys? When did this happen? This is a great conversation. What are your guys is like, oh fuck, I'm getting old moments that have happened recently. The hair mm. thing for sure for me. Yeah. Cause that happened that all of a sudden accelerated at like. <laughs> Yeah. I went through these wow. these spurts, right? So when we were younger, I have like my two best friends that go all the way back. I talk about them all the time. I would go all the way back since high school. And <clears throat> that of the three of us, my one buddy, like he was thinning in high school. And so it was like- So the, you knew. It was like, oh, yeah. so and, you know, imagine we used to tease the fuck out of him. We're like, you know, early 20s, just like, oh, you know, the hairline shit all the time. <laughs> fuck. And he just, you know, he chalked it up about, I don't know, 25 or so. Just fuck this. Just start shaving it completely. Grows his beard out. And he's got the facial hair thing. He's had that since he was 25 or maybe even earlier. Yeah. Then my other buddy and I, we were cool. We were good, dude. We were solid. You know what I'm saying? Good good hairline, like thick hair, still getting compliments from the hairstylist. Like, man, you got great, beautiful hair. Somewhere around like 27, he started to get like this spot on the back of his head. And I remember, dude, like we would all just, my boy that was boy, I told you motherfuckers all that teasing it was going to happen to you sooner or later. And, you know, he fought it for a while. 
And then he just owned it, shaved it also. And so I've been like the last one to go, you know, and I've been fighting it off for a really long time. And I've tried all these different hairstyles to like make it look better, but <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. At the, I'm at the point now where it's You're like, like, it's okay. You got a hat. Yeah, you know, I wear a hat when I sleep now, when I shower. Yeah, I so every, <laughs> everywhere I go now, it's like, got a hat. You know, I, I always I get a call ahead for reservations. Like, hey, what's dress code? Can I wear a hat? You okay, know what, though? Back we in can the, go. Back in the day, they used to have sleeping caps. Yeah. You ever remember, you ever watch cartoons? I wear sleeping a cap? Ooh, yeah. sleeping caps. Yeah. 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 I feel it's uncomfortable. It was a thing. But every time I look in the mirror and I'm like brushing my teeth, my head's down, I'm, especially in the morning time when my hair's all fucking going different directions and you just like can see your scalp. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you read your own mind. You're yeah. getting old, bro. So that's your getting old moment right there? There's nothing else? Um, I think in two, Cause like- Because that happens sometimes when you're young. I mean, yeah. you're in your 20s. Well, for me, it, like, it, was, it was mainly like, okay, so I was with a, a group of-, of younger people let's just say in a car right and like they wanted to choose music and like play it and so i'm like i'm like riding shotgun and so i'm like okay whatever cool and so they started playing music and it was just like i just i noticed like my facial expressions and like my <laughs> eyes like started squinting yeah. really hard and i was just like oh like it was, like i just couldn't relate at all and it was too loud i'm like oh is this is this how you guys listen to this this is too loud that's it <laughs> like what in the fuck have you noticed i can't even think have you noticed that shit's too loud now I, yeah, everything's too loud it used to never be too loud yeah nothing was ever too loud for me I'm like, everything's too loud and then i, I too yell loud. at people yeah. yeah like if like like somebody's speeding i'm just like hey <laughs> yeah like what are you doing so, meanwhile you knew you were an asshole like at 16 years old fucking mashing around oh donuts in the car and stuff like Dude, that oh, i so, hate uh people that drive like maniacs i'm like what the fuck katrina had a katrina had an old moment just yesterday so here's here's before. mine and then i'm gonna hear katrina's but here's mine this is something that I didn't even know was an old moment until it happened to me. And I was like, oh, fuck. So old people, when they sit down, when they first sit down, this is what they do. I'll show you. Ready? Yeah. Uh, like, like they make oh, that yeah. sound. <laughs> right? I do that tying my shoes. What the fuck? I mean, I, in the morning, I'm trying to put my shoes. I'm like. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I did it yesterday, right? I sat down with my kids and I just went. Uh, and I'm like, oh, fuck. Fuck. Uh, yeah. And then I thought about it, like my objective, like analytical mind. I'm like, why it's like am when I when that door hinge gets a squeak? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. why am I making that weird That's grunting sound? Us. And it's because it's what it is is you try to maintain core stability <laughs> when you sit down. <laughs> just you have to consciously do it now. Yeah, and then you yeah. like let it out. You have to, you have to let, it, let it out slowly so you don't hurt your back. You know? so, so you're just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you're not lifting weights. Oh my god, you're sitting on the couch. Or if if like your your conversation starts to be just based around like what's going on with your body you know internally <laughs> yeah. like i'll start saying something like i was just having a normal conversation and all of a sudden like i had this weird like sound <laughs> going on in my stomach and it was going up to my throat it's like <laughs> and my friend just talks like what the fuck was that dude i'm like i don't know man <laughs> that's some new, weird stuff going on that was a new one yeah that was a new one <laughs> or yeah. or how about this I'm like taking this new medication another one too that I, this one's like rather recently too is like in the morning a good or bad shit will set the whole day you know yeah. what i'm saying like yeah like like people will be like damn dude why are you in a bad mood today and i'll be like i don't know why and i'll think about it, like i didn't have a good shit <laughs> Like so much stuff yeah. goes wrong. There's a lot of friction. It's on that not one. fair, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's not fair. What happened to Katrina? What was well, her? it was Katrina and I both. So we just this last weekend we went uh, <clears throat> we went shopping. It's been a while since we gone shopping and uh, re cleaned out the closet, upgraded some shit. And it was so funny. Sounds like an R. Kelly song. So we're we're <laughs> we're out though, right? So we we both you know we both get you know a bunch of new stuff. And then uh, of course you know after you go shopping like that you you want to wear some of your new shit. So we you know we both are. You know, in our new fits uh, that we've just purchased, and we go out, and I think we're having sushi that night. We're out having dinner, <clears throat> and we run into a couple of people that I know that are like really young. They're well, not really young; they're like twenty three, twenty four, and uh, they both uh, make a compliment to us, and they're like, "Man, you guys look fucking great, dude! I love this fit." And I, asking about asking about it and everything like that, and then right after that, we go somewhere else, run into somebody else, and same thing. And Katrina, oh, the both of us are like, oh yeah, yeah, cool, right? But as soon as we get like by ourselves, it's like this fist pump right away. Like, we got <laughs> we got complimented by like twenty three year olds. We were like, noticed. Like, yeah, you see that? They, you noticed? You noticed my outfit, right? Did you yeah. know that she noticed your outfit, right? Like, fuck yeah, we're still we still got this, right? Yeah. But the fact that it was like this fist pump, like excited uh, moment for you afterwards, uh, was that sign of like, oh. 
oh man like, we're that like old. you guys are trying yeah like yeah it was, like now like, you're trying yeah, it's like we had yeah. to before it's a natural thing oh, that just oh, happens. we can relate with you guys yeah. <laughs> yeah. hi kids yeah. i just think you, you you end up giving up at some point you know what I mean? that's exactly what happens i used to yeah. okay i remember literally being a trainer i used to run camps all the time this was something i used to say to my campers right I'd be 25 years old, and I'd have a. Oh, gr- this is your famous quote. Oh my happy campers! I used, I used to tell I used to tell them all the time that like, <clears throat> you know, hey, part of my job is training. That was the joke, right? Like, I'm, I'm here to help get you in shape, this and do all those things, but I'm also here to help you guys not get old. And at one point in your life, you stop to not give a fuck. Like, and I'm here to make sure you give a fuck for the rest of your life. Like, don't stop listening to new music. Don't stop following new trends. Don't because that's part of your youthfulness. I promise you that. And I said, so I would tell and preach this all the time. And then it hit me one day where, and I remember the moment it happened to me. I was, I think I was 30 and I'm driving around back then I had that lifted Chevy and I was like blaring like hinder. And then like I drove by, right? And I was like, I'm feeling, I felt cool. Music was blasting, yeah, windows yeah. were down, you know? Yeah, like, what's up? Yeah, right? Yeah. And, and I'm driving by and I drive by a bunch of like younger kids and stuff. And I and I caught that moment, I caught the moment where they're looking at me. And, it, and in my head, the first, like it's the way it's processing <laughs> is like, yeah, I'm cool. They see I'm cool. Yeah. But as we get closer and I go by, they start laughing and pointing at me. And I could Oh tell, my God. And then there was this like, I'm not cool. <laughs> And <laughs> oh man! And then I like then I actually evaluated like oh shit like I'm probably listening to a song right now that's like eight years old you mm-hmm. know and I'm blaring it like on am bla- and then I remember thinking to myself fuck I remember these guys I remember when I was their age and I remember seeing these guys and looking at my buddies yeah. going back dude, then it was a Trans Am yeah, yeah. what a tool dude he's like yeah. that shit was so old remember when that was cool like with oh. my friends and I realized like. Oh God, that was me, and that was that moment for me that I got. I, and I believe that everybody gets stuck in an era. Yeah, for sure. Everybody does. Yeah. When you're young, right? I haven't even picked one. When you're, <laughs> 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 you messed it all together. Yeah, I think, yeah. or just made up my own. Uh, you know, everybody. This is the future. Everybody does this. You can look at somebody, okay, especially somebody that's older than thirty, and you can see, you can see where they got stuck. You know, if you're forty, fifty, whatever like that, oh, I can look man. at someone's outfit and go like. And the music you're listening, the music you're listening yeah. to, and you're the totally outfit you're grunge. And I know like, like where, where you got stuck, and you didn't keep evolving with time. And that's we all do it. So, so you guys, yeah. you you work, you both worked at the Santa Teresa 24. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do you guys? Do you guys remember? I don't know if you kept coming there, but do you guys remember the dude that would come in with the straight up like fucking scorpions hair? Like he had the, the he was blonde. <laughs> you never saw him, <laughs> bro. I think I mean I almost I actually walked up to him and asked him if he was in a like a cover band or something because I thought maybe this was part of his thing. He's like, like a hair metal band, bro. It was I swear to God, dude. It was literally like wow, like pretend like it's like oh, today's that... Halloween and I'm gonna put a wig on. See, That's I love like. people like that. That's amazing. You know what I mean? Like, just kind of, did he have like tight pants? Bro, he's like fifty five, dude. That's great. It was it was <laughs> yeah. just coming stuck in, in that era. Yeah, right? He was super uh, stuck. Yeah, that's what happens. So I, I would always tell He's clients, like, I'd give yeah. them like exercises <laughs> yeah. to do. Like, listen, you need to watch MTV for two hours. That's it. A week. That's all I want you to do. Just yeah. watch it. You know, just watch it. Absorb is MTV, it. I feel like MTV isn't even cool anymore. Well, it's not for us. The internet is. Is it? For, Nobody watches like, that shit. Dude. All it is is like catfish or, or whatever. Yeah. Like, no, what a it, fucking stupid show. Well, it, it's. See, you know, see, that's what an old person would say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so dumb. <clears throat> well, that's, be- that's the problem. Because we Basically, were, you got to pay attention to all the stuff that you think is dumb. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of Ooh, I got bamboozled yeah. by some fucking creepy internet guy. You have to be you have to be a little bit open minded, right? You, you're not, it's, I'm not saying that MTV is going to provide like all the answers yeah. to anybody staying in style whatsoever, but it's it's uh, staying in touch with the, the the younger generation, which is also why I still always keep like, like a handful of like young hip kids around me. So I can yeah, let, you know, you, I'm not afraid to you ask. use them for their. I'm youth? not afraid to ask. Like I hey, keep waiting. I'm like, where's the cool stuff? I, right. I, when I see the cool stuff, I really go for that. You you know, but I'm like, that's it's just- yeah. But this is like what I told you guys the other day. Like your understanding or what your thought process of what cool is is totally disconnected from what oh, really is anymore. You know, right? it's gonna suck, and it hasn't. Right now, it's cool to be kind of you know, I don't even want to say it, dude. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to give it away, or you don't yeah, know what you're gonna say. No, I don't even know what it is to be honest. I, I haven't figured just, it out just yet. Just was about to yeah. say, like, hey guys, you know what's cool? Yeah, because I don't like really <laughs> soft asking. music, yeah, I mean, and it's yeah. like you know, yeah, like wearing all this like you know, stupid clothes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, I, yeah. so nobody's fucking manly anymore you know so I mean? nondescript yeah. you know what i mean yeah. no you know what's gonna suck because it hasn't happened yet but it will pretty soon dude 
at some point, you're going to fucking be very proud that you can work out harder than the fucking 20-something-year-old dude at the gym mm. pretty soon. It's not there yet because I'm still pretty. I'm doing pretty good. But like, you know, within a 10-year period, I'm going to be looking at them and being like, oh, yeah, I kept up with the fucking 20-something-year-old, and then I'm going to go take a bunch of ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. God damn it. <laughs> Whatever, dude. I still have more testosterone than he does. Yeah. Bring on a young bird, please. Step right up, all you bearded men and all you bearded ladies. This quad is brought to you by Big Top Beard Company, whose all-natural beard oil products not only make your beard smell amazing, but feel amazing, too. Their organic essential oil blends transport you to manly places like the mountains, the desert, the sea, and beyond, all while encouraging a lot of beard nuzzling to boot. Mm. Buy it for yourself or as a gift for that special bearded someone at BigTopBeardCompany.com. Enter the discount code Mind Pump for 33% off at checkout. All right. Our first question is from Erica Candice asking about postnatal recovery after a baby and you've been cleared by your doc. Did you pick this one, Sal? No. Sound, the one guy who has no kid yeah, in his like, life. Yeah, yeah. Adam picked it. I want to talk about pregnant ladies. Yeah, Adam. Yeah. Adam. Adam's got a thing for. Well, pregnant, you pregnant got, girls. I knew that you guys. You know, every time a pregnant woman, we see what Adam's like. Oh my god, they're so hot. Like That's so yeah. weird. He, he likes it's that. This weird I, gotta, I do have a, a pregnant it's fetish. I don't know what it is. Out it's that. weird. Maybe because there's. I. I know it she, does exist. I know she's easy. Oh my oh god. My. <laughs> Bro. What do you mean easy? You- <laughs> or a for sure thing. No, know? like it no. works. You know, you like, mean, like, yeah. hold, hold on. Let me let me wow. tra- let me translate. <laughs> Here's what Adam does. Adam what he's trying to say is he knows she's already had sex. But yeah. What comes out of his mouth is ten times more asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One hundred percent. She's not. She's easy. I know just offended like yeah. all the pregnant. No, women. that's oh, not yeah. true. Fucking yeah. asshole. That's not true. Um postnatal recovery. There, she's been just so you know before I don't know if Doug put it up there or not she's it, she's been cleared so it's not like it's let's just make that clear right that you, yeah you, step you, number one you got to be cleared for exercise when the rule number one for me when I would train women after pregnancy and there's two categories of of, of people that I would train postnatal one were the people that I trained before during before and during pregnancy which is much, much easier, much, uh, uh, and it's actually quite different. Oh, yeah, you barely skip a beat with that person. You don't, yeah, I mean, you still have to, you know, you still want to focus on a few things, but somebody who's not worked out and then had a baby and then wants to get into working out, you have to pay uh, much closer attention um, and be a little bit more careful. But rule number one, after having a baby, is fo- focus on core stability. Yeah. Focus on activating neuromuscular recruitment. So yeah. yeah, it's really that connection that you're seeking initially. It's you want to just regain these kind of functions and get the muscles to respond the way that they need to. Yeah, because what happens when you obviously when you have a baby, the baby grows uh, in the uterus and it stretches out all of the muscles of your core. Mm-hmm. And when they're stretched, when muscles are stretched, they're automatically weakened. And you can test this out yourself. You can put yourself in a really, really deep stretch, and then try to activate that muscle. It's actually quite difficult. In fact, I would recommend not trying to activate it super hard when you're in a deep stretch because you may actually injure yourself. So muscles, number one, are naturally weakened in this stretched position. So now you're pregnant. You've got this baby growing, so your, your, your belly is big. All those muscles are stretched out, so they're already in a weakened position. And you're, you're limited, especially in the third trimester, in, in terms of how you can activate them, or at least you can't activate them <laughs> in any type of you know full range of motion. Yeah. So you lose connection to those muscles. So then after, and, and what ends up stabilizing you a lot during your pregnancy are your hip flexors. Yeah. Hip flexors and low back. That's why you get a lot of low back problems uh, during pregnancy. So after you have the baby, you want to reconnect to those muscles. And that does not mean you go do a bunch of sit-ups and leg raises. No. Um, because you're just going to recruit the muscles that are still connected, which are your hip flexors. Mm-hmm. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to activate, first focus on activating those muscles that you've lost connection to, and then slowly focus on strengthening them through uh, ranges of motion. Motion. We actually posted a video on our YouTube channel. It's Mind Pump TV, um, and you can look it up. It's called Hip Flexor Deactivator. Deactivator yeah. And it's a movement that I do with uh, anybody who's got hip flexor dominance, but especially post, uh, post-pregnancy or you know postnatal. Um, and it's a great way to kind of... Get the hip flexors to step out a little bit while activating some of the muscles of the core. And then the second video I recommend you watch is uh, another popular video we have on there is uh, uh, stomach vacuums. 
And vacuums are, that's probably one of the first exercises I do with a, with a woman who just had a baby because mm-hmm. I'm trying to activate their the deep core. Yeah. Their deep core muscles, the muscles, the, the transverse abdominis that pulls in. What about the belly the breathing mid-section. that you did with uh, Stephanie too? Be- belly breathing. Uh, you know, that's another one where you're kind of learn mm-hmm. get, getting that diaphragm to fully mm-hmm. inflate again, because it's, that's, I'm glad I'm actually really happy you brought that up, Adam, because when you have a baby, you know, the baby, obviously when it's growing and it's big presses up into the diaphragm and you tend to breathe shallow mm-hmm. out of necessity. And so you want to change that breathing breathing pattern back to its normal one. Otherwise you can experience um, you know, a little bit of anxiety or, or feeling like you're not getting a full diaphragm. And, and as you're you're sort of going through that process of reactivating, you know, and getting the abdominals to respond and, and you know, going through that exercise that's on the YouTube, just instead of like focusing on reps and sets and all that kind of stuff, really just the intent there is to uh, just really try to squeeze and, and connect. And so I, I recommend more like isometric sort of work to just, you know, really try and focus down that signal and, and get it to respond and, you know, kind of gradually work your way towards reps and getting back into the, to the, to the, swing of things for the most part though i I feel like uh, a lot of stuff is the same i think there's been i think a lot of things uh there's a lot of stuff out there to either scare or intimidate people into like oh you need to do this or oh you need to take that there's a lot of myths too yeah there's a lot but you could jump ahead is what i think why we're being like kind of cautionary like or like being real like specific is like these are like the first sort of items yeah. is because if you could just start working out, but now all of a sudden you're not going to have the the support system there to support your spine as well. Well, the well. biggest just, mistake uh, the, I see is, I was going to say, the biggest mistake I see is when women who don't work out have a baby, is that they're in this rush yeah, now exactly. to now get in gotta shape. Get, gotta get all the weight off. Well, and they make a tons of mistakes. Let's talk about that for a second because here's <clears throat> the reason why I said that was not because, I mean, 100% I agree with the boys. Like This is important. In my experience, though, I feel like this is the what I get is really common is someone who's uh, had a baby and then like you said either one they're in like this hurry like oh my god I have all this this baby weight that I've put on and now it's time to get serious the the whole time they were in pregnancy they ate like shit they didn't really move and exercise and now they're on this mission to you know build, rebuild their body and it's like all intensity driven so there's that one extreme. And then you have the the other people that are, you know, they have been going like consistently through. They've been trained. They train through their pregnancy, and they're out of their pregnancy now. Someone like that, it's all you can almost just keep on going. Like you've just, if you've done a good job of exercising while you were pregnant, which I've trained people literally up into the day they had their baby, you can just pick up right where you left off and keep going and you're probably going to be pretty damn good and there's a lot of scare tactics out there to scare pregnant women away from training and oh don't you don't push too hard don't do this well what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't go any harder than what you were going before so if you're someone who trained pretty consistently and then you get pregnant i don't recommend stopping working out i recommend doing all the pretty much the same stuff you were doing going into your pregnancy and just listen to your body yeah, yeah like if you're doing if you're if all of us you the know biggest thing yeah if you're doing a bunch of roman chair sit ups and leg raises and planks and now you're like ooh those hurt me because i have this big belly now you know i'm in my third trimester just stop doing them yeah. uh, but your body's incredibly capable throughout most of your pregnancy um, yeah. i mean you can do some you can keep working out Pretty much, uh, like Adam said, till the day you give birth, so long as you're healthy and, and you know nothing, you know, major goes so, wrong. Some of the women I've seen do that are the ones that are still squatting all the way through their pregnancy, you know, and they come out and they they're still squatting. You're doing a lot of movements that you still would do. I, I just as long as you're doing those, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and you don't, you're not like trying to ramp up through yeah, your pregnancy, of which is a doing you know, I do see that though too, like you know, oh, I'm getting pregnant, so I got to now, you know, really intensify my workouts, like to to bounce back. Two mistakes with with that. Uh, one is if you're ramping up your intensity uh, from where it was before, after you just got pregnant, the signal that you're sending your body is stress is up. Uh, we are now in a new situation, a new environment with higher demands on the body. And one of your body's last resorts, believe it or not, in a situation like that is to uh, not complete the pregnancy. Um, and there's been cases of this where, and this is where the scare tax- tactics come from, where a woman will, who doesn't work out, gets pregnant, is super afraid of getting fat, and then decides she's going to run a marathon. And then she loses the child or something bad happens or she hemorrhages and gets bed rest. 
well, yeah, you're, you're telling your body that you've just entered into a new stressful situation. Your body knows that you're pregnant. So it's going to think in, in your, your kind of, you know, the, ba- the baby's a priority, but you are a priority as well. And your body will make sure that you are okay. And if it thinks that the stress is new and too much, bad things can happen. So don't change anything. The, here's the perfect scenario. Perfect scenario is this. You're already exercising. You already have a good, you know, routine. You're already fit. You're doing everything right. Then you get pregnant and then you just keep doing what you're doing. Don't have to change anything. Listen to your body. Then you stop when you think you need to. A lot of women don't need to up until, again, like the day the day before they have the baby. Some women feel like they absolutely are super uncomfortable, have to stop a few weeks before. Mm. Have your baby, uh, depending on if you had C-section or how your, your labor went. Get clearance by your doctor. Go back to the gym. Start slow, but you will be surprised at how fast you bounce back. I've had clients back, back bounce back incredibly, I mean, compared to the average person, incredibly quick because they went into it mm-hmm. already fit and they went into it with the understanding that uh, there's a process and that they're not well, going to- Well, it'll help with the labor, you know, oh. being strong, yeah, going into labor, so. You know, and we got to realize something like, we always forget that uh, when women got pregnant for most of the human civilization- it wasn't like, oh my God, you're pregnant. Don't do shit anymore. Like, yeah, you have. That wasn't an option. It wasn't yeah. an option. Yeah. Like, you're still, you're still, ga- you're still hunting and gathering. You're still part of the tribe. You're still, you might have another child. Uh, you still have to stay, you know, moving, and, and it increases your odds of successful, you know, labor. Um, it wasn't it, like it is, you know. And now we're better at it. Now we tell yeah. women keep moving. But it wasn't that long ago. Like when we were born, like around the, you know, the 70s and 80s. Even then, they were telling women, like, relax, don't oh, move. Uh, the only way they delivered babies were women were on their back. Um, now, you know, they're I was going to talk about that. Different- yeah, because I, I give my wife a lot of credit. She did, uh, we had a doula actually come with us to um, kind of help with the process. And that really helped me to kind of help coach. And, uh, you know, she actually was able to do a lot what, more. What did positions. you call it? A doula? Doula. Called doula. Yeah. A doula? Yeah. What is that? It's a it's like a, a person who it's like almost like a nurse, but their their expertise is in, is uh, in delivery. Delivery, yeah. That's all they do. Is mm-hmm. is that an acronym for something? I have no idea. That's a good. That's a yeah, good question. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. it's it's a thing. I, I don't. She. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, one of her friends was one and offered to to be that for us. So it really just helps the like. Did you guys go to the hospital though? Right. You didn't do yeah, we home? went to the hospital. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you I, do the whole epidural thing? No. So wow, your both, wife did both. Na- yeah, both. Nothing? N- yeah, without an epidural, and yeah. and that's not like shaming any other like women that that do that or anything. But I just I was, you know, I I totally respected that because that was something she had like in her mindset that she wasn't going to do. And then even though certain points it was like ah, like she still didn't do it, mm-hmm. you know. So wow. Um and and tried all these different um you know positions to help it move it along, and it worked. You know, it mm-hmm. was like very. Um, you know, very outside, unconventional, let's just say. So yeah, exercise, cool. uh, being fit, uh, eating right will decrease your chance. I don't know what the number is, but it's pretty, it's a significant statistical difference in terms of your odds of, of needing a C-section. So if you're fit, healthy, you know, you're eating right, moving, you're not, you know, bed rest and all these different things, the odds that you'll need a C-section are much slow, are much lower, and you want this. Obviously, a C-section can be a pain in the ass to recover from. If you have more children after that, it's it's getting more and more difficult to find doctors that will actually deliver a second or third child after you've had a C-section. So they mm-hmm. don't they don't do V-backs as much anymore. What they're called, yeah. um, and there is some evidence cool. suggesting, uh, and it's pretty strong that um, children who are born through C-section have a higher risk of allergies, food allergies, food intolerances, and autoimmune issues because they're not exposed to- The vaginal bacteria. Yeah. Uh, now, I will say there was one caveat. They did find there is some bacteria in utero as well. Mm. So it's not completely sterile, but still, those studies do show that being you know born vaginally um, is probably uh, you know better if if you can well, do it and, that way. You know the epidural too. If if you know the the recovery for that is a bit longer than if not. So you know like I, Courtney was kind of de- describing it to me, but basically like yeah, it, it puts you out. Like mm-hmm. I mean, you, your recovery time like extends a bit, you know, with that. So if I had to recommend a program to someone, I would say uh, pre phase of Maps Anabolic coupled with, with Maps Prime. Perfect. That's how I would start. Yeah, that'd be a perfect. That'd be the perfect routine. Or um, maps anywhere minus the amp sessions. There you go. Um, if you don't, if you don't want, want to go to the gym. 
Mark Wolves is asking on your thoughts about best deadlift grips. So for for me, this is a great question because uh, I love deadlifting. I love pulling. And for years, I trained, uh, I used an alternate grip, <clears throat> your standard powerlifting, you know, one hand supinated, one hand pronated uh, grip mm -hmm. when deadlifting very heavy. The problem with this was that I got really, really good or really comfortable, I should say, training the, the, the recruitment pattern to where my right hand was supinated and my left hand was pronated. So it wasn't very often that I would pronate uh, my right hand and supinate my left hand. So it ended up being my, my, that was like my default heavy grip. And so what I would do is I'd go up to 315 with a double overhand grip and then over, anything over 315, I'd alternate my grip and then the right hand would supinate and, and that would be how I'd pull. As a result, um, I started, I developed some imbalances in my back, which I could tell. Um, and I could tell because visually uh, and mechanically or just one of the other, actually both. Yeah. So when I would get a massage, the, the person that would massage me said, well, it looks like one, you know, like the, this part of your back seems more tense or th a little thicker. And, uh, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. And then I would, I, I'd like come up, go up against the wall. I put my back up against the wall and kind of, you know, round my shoulders. And then I noticed that there was a little discrepancy between the two sides. So one side developed a little bit more. A little bit more um, because of the of the grip. And you do take off, the bar takes off a little differently that way. It's very, very subtle. Mm -hmm. But if you constantly lift this way, that can happen. And then uh, the second thing is when I would go to try to alternate my grip, I'd get really fucking sore in my right pronator teres. It would almost injure it. And it was all because I wasn't used to pulling heavy weight with my hand in that position. And it wasn't that long ago. It was maybe, I don't know, it's only been about a year or so, maybe a little less. And I said, that's it. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to pull like this anymore. And at first I thought, I said, I'm going to alternate. I'm just going to alternate and go the other way. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to try and get really good at a hook grip because a hook grip is both hands overhand. They're both the same. I don't have to keep track of how often I'm doing one side versus the other. And it took me a long time, and I'm almost at the point where I can hold on to as much weight with a hook grip. Oh, really? You're there? Yeah, as I can with an alternate <coughs> I was gonna grip. I going to ask you yeah, that. It takes a and, long time to develop. I though. fucking hate it. And yeah, I tell yeah. you what, if you get good at it, you can handle Look, Olympic lifters pull fucking tremendous amounts of weight with a hook grip. Yeah. Lane Norton is a super strong deadlifter. He uses a hook grip. Is he a hook grip? He's know. a hook grip lifter. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's been hook gripping for a long time. If you get really good at it, you can pull just as much weight uh, with a hook grip. It just sucks. It just takes time to get used to. So my personal opinion, the best grip, hook grip. However, give it some time and, and, and you know get your body used to doing it because at first it hurts your thumbs and then you can't hold on as long and you're, you're going to get sore in your pronator teres and all kinds of different things. So. Uh, well, I don't think I don't think you're going to hear any debate from any of us that that is by far the best. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I – the only thing I will say is that what sucks if you've been lifting the other ways for a very long time, yeah, you're regressing. You have to regress a for, lot. Yeah, a lot for a while. Like I even for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I went on a kick from the hook grip for a little bit, and I just got frustrated with it. I was just like, God, it hurts my hands. It's just not comfortable. Like, you know. And then I felt like it, it was just hindering the rest of my workout. So, um, fuck yeah, dude. It's 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 definitely superior though. There's no doubt. Over over is better than mm -hmm. than alternating for sure. I mean, th when you think about it for, uh, biomechanically, I mean, when you supinate your hand like that, you're going to activate the lat more on that side. It's just that's just a fact. That's what it's partially responsible for. So as soon as you internally rotate like that, the lats are going to get activated more versus when you're protein. Not not side. to mention the think about the <laughs> internal external rotators of the humerus, right? The infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscles, for example, and some of the other you know muscles that are involved in internally well, actually rotating. That's the last. So, well, uh, so if you're in this position, sure, because some people are going to say, well, you're not rotating, you're not actively rotating internally, externally. You don't have pulling. to be. You're isometrically uh, isometrically, contracted. and so what you're doing is you're getting that muscle really strong at pulling heavy weight in that shortened position on one mm -hmm. side, and in the lengthened lengthened position on the other side. That is a small, subtle difference. And you're not going to notice it, but if you do it for you know but as months the load and years, increases, yeah, and like repetitive volume, like it's just all going to add up. So. Well, so and I had this is where you know, and it reminds me way back when when we first started talking about this, and I really got rid of my wraps because of you. And I have to admit now that like I would reintroduce wraps with a double overhand grip. I think is superior to a power grip. Now, for competing reasons, you can't. 
like you, if you're a competitor, you don't get to use wraps in a competition. Like you got to go barehanded. So I understand the benefits of somebody who's going to be competing, but I'm not ever, well, as of right now, I have no plans of doing a powerlifting meet, but I do like to go really heavy and my grip does become limiting at a certain point. And so in my opinion, once you get to a certain point, I think a double over with wraps would be more superior to the average lifter than somebody who goes over I mean, under. I'll tell you why I disagree to that. Okay. Uh, because we have now uh, several studies that demonstrate that using wrist wraps promotes different recruitment patterns all the way up in the shoulder. And so what you're doing is you're trading, you're trading one bad recruitment pattern uh, for another. Now, it may be more asymmetric if you constantly use the same uh, grip, uh, the, the constantly use the same uh, over under grip. But by using wraps, you are changing the recruitment patterns all the way up in the shoulder. And they're the kind of recruitment patterns that promote um, shoulder dysfunction. You can, over time. you can argue that same thing yeah. with the over under. You could argue the same thing, bro. I, so I don't think it's better or worse. I, I just think, I, I think it's I in the same category. This is where I disagree, though. As I, being somebody okay, who has actually done it for a long period both ways and has seen the imbalances that they, they have caused, I have never had as many imbalances in my shoulder and my back as I start as much as I have from heavy lifting over under. Then I, I used to use wraps all the time with yeah, heavy lifting. Yeah, but you're, you're going from I, one of the – I think, I think what, what's the best is – Hook grip. Yeah, oh, we agree. Yeah. We all agree on yeah. that. If you can train yourself, if you have the discipline to that to do a hook grip, I agree a hundred percent with you. And then after a hook grip, then it would just be a regular over 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 grip. Mm -hmm. um, but then I would I would argue that I would rather do. I, and you will see me now use straps with a with both hands over before I go into but a why, why power not grip. why not develop or keep practicing well then your, that would be ideal yeah. that would be ideal why, but, why, uh, but, uh, why but I'm just going to keep it real that I, I probably won't you know and if I probably won't I would choose to use the wraps over I would the over under and that's because why did you stop with the over with the hook because it would it was driving me crazy hurts your, yeah hurts I didn't your, like it it was it wasn't hands. comfortable I wasn't deadlifting enough it's not a sport for me to care that much um, so, I mean, it's just like you squatting with squat shoes or a weight belt. Mm -hmm. We can sit here, talk circles all day long about it's not ideal, but the, at the end of the day, people are still going to utilize these tools. I guess it and, depends what you're looking at. I mean, if your goal is to just lift as much weight as possible, yeah, I guess use wrist straps. If your goal is to develop, is to, to be able to connect the entire chain and be able to hold on to the weight and lift it and stabilize it then you'd want no wraps and you'd want double overhand grip and you'd want to develop that as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, we're all on the same page. Yeah. I'm just sharing my experience from mm -hmm. being somebody who's actually now applied Okay, all of those methods. And the only one that I didn't go for a very long time is the overhand with the hook grip, mm -hmm. which I would agree would be the superior one if I was to discipline my ass to keep going to regress to go through all that, to work my way back to lifting with that. But I'll tell you now, if you catch me pulling really heavy weight, I, you'll find me probably use the wraps, which I haven't even done. So just say that is like, you know, whatever. But I would, I, what I have done to myself by doing an, a heavy over under grip, I have caused more dysfunction in my shoulder and my back. You kept mm. it the same, right? The same side, supinated and pronated. Yeah, well, thing? yeah, it, for most of the time. I mean, I tried to do, go for a while where I switched the other way, and that you that just too. found your strong side. Yeah, I mean, if I, I was going for, if I was chasing PRs, and that, and that's really what I was trying to lift this heavy, I was going to go with what felt the most comfortable yeah. and dominant. You that know, sucks, a lot so. of that is yeah, ego based. I, for yeah. me, it's already like I, it's it's a weak lift for me, so it's like I don't like necessarily chime in with you guys, but like I'll try just to go double overhand and then if i don't get any heavier from that you know that grip then i'm done what about when you because you do uh a lot of power movements and although right. you're not lifting as much as you are when you're deadlifting mm -hmm. you're having to generate speed yep. which requires a lot of grip you don't use a hook grip on that i don't use a hook grip mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh, okay just, just overhand not bad yeah. is there is there are there any like uh power lifters or olympic lifters that don't even use a hook grip and actually are pulling like I, I, there's none that i know not of. sure yeah not sure about that like almost everybody is a yeah they're all hooked Hook Olympic lift yeah, uh, hook grip is like part of yeah. the protocol with Olympic lifting. I wouldn't mind developing it. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah it would it would help for sure. Yeah, I mean, th I think that's we could all agree on that. There's yeah. no doubt the hook grip for sure over over and then over over and then where maybe we disagree a little bit is the wraps versus the over under. And I'm just speaking from experience that being a guy that's done both for a long periods of time, I caused more dysfunction in my shoulders and my back than I ever did with wraps. I did with that makes sense. the over under. Lindsay Adair, 23. What is the biggest mistake you see new trainers making? And what were your mistakes as a new trainer? Oh, 
number one, I think, and I, I believe it's still common, goes all the way back to when we trained, and it drives me crazy to see, is intensity driven workouts. Mm. Uh, the flashy a, workouts. A, yes, yeah. a lack of attention to detail and movement, and if too much emphasis on can I come up with the most creative, you know, fucking backbreaker workout for my clients i to this day i go to the gym and it's the thing i i just and i and I, you know it's like watching a slow train wreck for me i just can't look away it's none of my business to come over i would never totally check a trainer in front of their client that's just i would never do that but i and i i cringe i watch these trainers and it's like this it's hard to watch it is hard yeah. be, be, but in and where i have patience too is i i went through that like right. i you got to remember that you uh, put yourself in there yeah right because yeah. we were there at one point i we yeah. were right and there was there was definitely and there's definitely a culture around that within f gyms is this you know who's got the most creative workout and you know what creative <sighs> workouts do not always and very rarely equal the most effective dude i i literally just had this conversation uh last week because i went to go work out you know where, where i go work out at i don't want to call it out just in case uh, they're listening but uh you see there's this group of women and they take the same they take this super high intensity workout driven uh cl class every morning by this one trainer and you, I can pick them out now. I've been doing this long enough to where I can see, and it's 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 you see this in men and women, but more often women uh, than men will end up in this category for some reason. And I think it's just because women tend to beat themselves up more um, than men tend to. But these women come in mid forties, maybe fifty, maybe late thirties, and you can tell their adrenal uh, fatigue. They're totally adrenal fatigue. Like their bodies are fucking broken down. They don't get a lot of sleep probably because they have small kids or they work a lot. They come in, they are, they're not overweight, but they're definitely, definitely loose because they haven't developed a lot of muscle. Or maybe better said, they're not obese, but they're overweight. They're, most, yeah. Of, most of them are pretty overweight. Yeah. They're like, it's like, it's like this, this look and I can, I know you guys can see it yeah, too. Like you yeah. can tell. I, I, know, like, I know what you're describing. And they come in and they've got the, the, they're tired. They've got the bags under their eyes. They're, they're all coming in and they work out and the trainer beats them the beats the fuck out of them and they're all just trying as hard as they can and he's yelling at them like go 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 and they're doing these sprints on the cardio and they're doing machines and circuits and they're punching a bag and they're doing all this crazy stuff and you can see that like first of all their form is there is no form like it's it's all about moving the weight mm -hmm. it's all about you know pedaling the bike it's all about just throwing my fist into the bag like they're not even punching the bag they're just moving their hands <laughs> and they're and they're fucking dying but what's, what's keeping these poor women moving is their total like they're all these grinders like they're so like i'm gonna keep doing this and i'm just gonna keep working at it. i'm gonna yeah. keep grinding and and they've been doing it for a long time i've been working out at this place now for mm. over a year well and they it's also the same women they also dis they also connect that like endorphin release of that they get post workout to like i feel better or i feel accomplished there's a short I, term I, right? yeah it's a very short term feeling that they and that's where i think how they get stuck here even if you're somebody who listens like there's somebody right now 100 percent the amount of people that have listened to this show 100 percent. there's someone listening to this right now it's fucking you okay you are that person you are that person oh my god and the reason out. why you do not you you you're like you're like fucking tuning this out right now is because you have connected that feeling that sweat feeling and that uh feeling of accomplishment and the the endorphin rush that you get for from pushing the body like that and so therefore you justify dude, it dude it was it's it, mm. it was horrible i was just watching this show talking, they, sweaty what, betty syndrome they were doing, talking to you they were doing squats with a barbell as part of their circuit and they're i mean they're fucking beat they were beat when they walked in they were already exhausted when they walked in this is like six something in the morning they're doing squats and they're fucking everywhere. Their knees are going everywhere. I mean, Jessica's like, oh my God. She goes, maybe we should go stand next to them in case one of them goes down. Knees are going all <laughs> over the place. They're adding weight. The trainer's just yelling at them like, keep going. You got to keep going. And and it's like, it's horrible. And the worst part about it is these women are trapped. And I'll tell you why they're trapped. They know instinctively that the second they fucking stop, they're going to gain it's a gonna shit. Blow up. They're going to gain a shit ton of weight. They're going to binge like crazy because their body is in such horrible stress state. And these trainers, they don't know any better and they continue to push them because what they do, and I did this too. I did this when I first became a trainer. You see this client and in your thought, all you're thinking is, 
I know why you're not getting leaner and why you're feeling like this because you're not eating as good as you should. You're not doing what I'm telling you, and you're not working out you're as hard out, or yes. as consistently Your as I'm telling you. Effort isn't there. You know, what it's like there. it's like a parent that like beats their children and they justify it because they they've seen results or they because they got beat when they were a kid. Look, now they're quiet. They exactly yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, seriously, right? It's yeah, like true. it's like a kid that got beat turned out to be a good kid, right, and successful in life, and says, "I'm going to beat my kids because I was beat," and so that's the mentality is like I'm gonna beat I got in shape because I beat myself up to get in shape and I have this discipline I'm gonna try and install that same thing in these people and what we're finding out is you know what beating kids is probably the not the best way to do it just because some of them just because some of them turn out all right just like the same thing goes for beating your clients like Mm -hmm. just because you got clients listen they turn into ray rice yeah that's all i'm saying dude i I feel just because you got some people in shape by doing that doesn't mean it's the most effective way to do it i feel so bad one of them even is really nice and comes and says hi to us and i'm looking at her and i can see the signs all the signs of excessive stress on her body, you know the the looseness of her body. The, the her face just looks drawn. She's got even some of the the the, the you'll see in, in women when they uh, you'll see this in anorexics too. But in women who push themselves so hard, they'll get this like micro fine you know kind of hair on their face or on their arms. It's a stress response, and they look horrible. They're drinking coffee. They're trying to stimulate their body to pick up even more. And I'm and I just want to say something. And the worst part is this is the worst part here is if I take them aside and sit and talk to them myself, the advice I'm going to give them, they're not going to listen to. Because my advice would be, hey, listen, here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to stop coming to the gym five days a week and beating yourself up. Uh, I'm going to want you to come work out two days a week. You're going to lift weights real basic. We're not going to go to failure. We're going to build up some strength. I want you to get more sleep. I want you to start drinking chamomile at night, and we're going to eliminate coffee for a little while. Uh, you're going to start doing meditation, and it's going to take us like six months before your body starts to get back on track. None of them will fucking listen to me. No one's going to want to do no. it. Yeah. But this is easily the biggest mistake trainers do, and what you're doing is you are destroying your clients. And here's a good sign, by the way, that you're that you're making this mistake, that you have a high turnover rate. If you are the kind of trainer that gets a client, beats them up, and they're super motivated for the first three to six months, and they're coming every workout, and the next thing you know, they're missing workouts, and next thing you know, they're yeah. not coming anymore, and you got to find more clients, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, people are so unmotivated. Oh, I need to just keep getting clients. Why can't people stick to my routine? It's because you're beating them, you're beating them up, and you're, and you're a shitty trainer. Yeah. The reality is when people are hiring you, yes. you should have a much higher stick rate People will stay with you because they feel good. And if you're a client, and if you're someone right now listening who works out and you're not a trainer, working out should make you feel good. You should not wake up feeling exhausted. You should not leave your workout feeling like you're dreading the day, like you just went through boot camp, like literal boot camp. You should feel good. You should feel centered. You should not have hot flashes and cold flashes. You should not have issues with your sleep. You should feel fucking balanced and amazing. And if you're not... Examine your workout, and I guarantee a lot of you, it's because you're going too hard. What's the second part to this? About our, it was about us, right? What yeah, was your biggest you mistake made. as a trainer? Oh, our. Well, that was it for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I was, went too hard. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's one hundred percent. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that could, you could have a, a bigger one than that, right? I think that's probably the. the I most. think you know when I read this question initially, I thought what we just talked about, and then I thought from the business side, maybe we could visit that for a second. One of the business biggest mistakes I see trainers make from a business side to build their business is they are don't believe in their own value. Uh, and this happens with new trainers all the time. Like I would yeah. get a trainer on board. They get competitive with their prices. Well, they look at the prices and they're like, well, you know, 90 a session. Like, mm. uh, you know, can I charge 60 or can I go less? Like mm. that feels like a lot. And it's like, you know, trainers instinctively, I think they'd like to train, but they don't like to sell or at least they don't, they feel like they're asking for money's not right or maybe they're not well, worth the it. The problem is that there's a lot of trainers like that. So therefore the, the, customer coming in will have that impression already so it's like the expectation is already at that level whereas you need to pull yourself out of that mentality and and understand that you know you're you're very valuable you just have to present it in that way and be confident in it don't be afraid to ask like don't be afraid to ask for the sale don't be afraid to tell people that it costs something there's like this huge fear among trainers like oh i don't know if i can ask them to to buy training from me or whatever it's like why that's your job right yeah all right, before I get to this next question, we do have Wim Hof here. Oh. Yeah, we got to bring that up. We have up. the Wim Hof certification. 
uh, coming up. What's the date for that, uh, Doug? Let's April 29th and 30th here at Mind Pump Studios. So April 29th and 30th. I don't know if, if you guys haven't heard of Wim Hof, the Wim Hof breathing method. It is like... The Iceman. It's fucking exploding. It is absolutely exploding. Uh, the Wim Hof methods have been adopted by uh, the military at the highest levels. It's being utilized by uh, top uh, executives in Fortune 500 companies. Um, it's a very effective way of getting your body to uh, improve its peak performance, mental and physical performance. It's quite legit. Uh, some of the, you know, we obviously uh, here at Mind Pump have the ability to meet with and talk to some of these, uh, some incredible mm. athletes. And uh, I'm, it's like a, a year and a half ago, I kind of heard of the breathing methods. Yeah. Now it's like everybody's doing it and talking Have about it. Have you seen he, like uh, that show Stan Lee's Superhuman? He, yeah. He right. was on there. It's just because he's like, he's figured out this way to, you know, tap into to breathing, to really get connected to the body on a level that's like a lot of people didn't even know you could get to. And he just has done superhuman feats because... Uh, you know, like he, he's just so in tune with that. And like, that's why, you know, like, and they're studying him in a lab and science and it's just very fascinating. I, I highly recommend. Well, you check I give, out that I'm fascinated with what it's doing for the immune system too. Like yeah. that's, that's what's really, really fascinating. That's some interesting shit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. That's yes. to me is what it's really, really cool. What they're finding with some of these, uh, with these breathing methods is your people who are really good at it and practice it are, are becoming able or at least are able enough to control to some degree the automatic systems of the body, mm -hmm. like um, the things that we don't we take for granted, like your heart beating, Heartbeat, your, your body lungs, temperature, yeah. all that stuff. Things that your body automatically does. Uh, people at the highest level of this type of training are able to lower temperature, increase their body mm -hmm. temperature, slow the heart rate on down. command. On command, yeah. Very, very interesting stuff. And uh, how do people register? They just go to our page. Yeah, go to the event calendar on the page and click on the Wim Hof MindPumpMedia.com. Excellent. That is correct. Next question. All sir. right. Our next question is J2264. What is the key to being happy? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. Yeah, you're right. Got it. all figured out. If I knew that I'm shit. happy. You know what's funny? Katrina and I had a Come literally on, last baby, night. Um, and, and I love this because I told you guys that we've been, her and I, like we every month uh, I'm reading like my own book that I'm going on. And then we we choose a book that we're reading together and it always promotes all this great dialogue, right? So afterwards, she's at, she asked this question, right? She goes, um, you know, what what does a, a perfect day look like for you? And I said, like, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I don't think I would, I would actually want that. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? And she's like, well, you know, like, do, if you, this was a perfect day, like, uh, you know, the day that you would want to have over and over and over again. I said, well, I think that's just it. I think, I think the perfect day is imperfect, right? I think that's part of what that drives us, and that's uh, all of this is embracing the challenges and the difficulties and and overcoming those is what makes things so awesome. And if it was so perfect that nothing bad happened and everything went smooth, if that just kept happening every single day, then really it would get boring really fast. Mm -hmm. So what does perfect look like and would you really want that is what I would I would challenge you. You, you know what that reminds me what you just said? You guys ever watched The Twilight Zone? Remember that? Yeah, that show? Fucking awesome, by the way. Super old, uh, way older than me. Great uh, uh, TV series um, with some great twists in it. There was one episode where there was a guy in the beginning, he's a bank robber, and then he's going in a shootout with these police officers, and then they kill him. And then he pops up, and he's in like this beautiful hotel room, and then this like guy walks in the room who's wearing this white suit, and he kind of looks uh, an, uh, like an angel almost, but he's just wearing a suit. And he's like, hey, welcome. He goes, you know, welcome. And he goes, where am I? And he goes, well, I mean, where do you think you are? And he goes, oh my God. He goes, this must be heaven. He goes, well, what do I do? And the guy goes, you can do whatever you want. Like, do whatever you want. And so this guy, he goes and gambles and every hand he wins. He goes and eats and he never gains a pound. Like every woman he talks to is attracted to him. And he's like, oh my God, heaven is awesome. And then they fast forward like five or 10 years later. He's over it. And he's, he's fucking miserable. He's so, so miserable. <laughs> and he calls the angel back and he goes, fucking change this. I hate this. Like I yeah. can't, this can't it's be not what, reality. He goes, this can't be what heaven is like. And then the angel looks at him and he goes, who told you this was heaven? It was a yeah. fucking amazing episode. Utopia, yeah. right? Like that yeah. was the whole Matrix thing. Like they had to like restructure the Matrix because it didn't work. Yeah. yeah. You know, this is a question that people, uh, there's books written on it. Uh, you know, it's been examined by, so, you know, monks and, you know, motivational speakers. And it's it's one of those like key human questions, you know, like why are we here? How do I, what's the key right. to being happy and all that stuff. 
I, for me, this is a very personal question because the last five years have been so challenging, uh, just beyond comprehension. I had, you know, at the time, you know, uh, when I was married, my wife had a horrible health situation happen where she almost passed away. She had a, uh, her appendix ruptured and, you know, she had to be, she was in the hospital for like 10 days. And then right after that, someone very, very close to me got diagnosed with cancer and then they fought it. And I was very, very intricately, you know, really intricately involved in that whole process of fighting the cancer, watching this person deteriorate. Then they passed away. Then I got divorced, uh, and going through that whole process. And it was, this was a, this is something that was, uh, that I constantly, you know, ask myself, like what it, first of all, wh- what's the key to being happy? And then number two, like, what is happiness? And for me, and I don't know the answer, so I'm not pretending to know the answer at all, but what helped me a lot was I was able to divide this into a couple different things. One of them was that I really realized that there were physical feelings of anxiety, depression, paranoia, happiness, and there were emotional feelings that are to those things. And they're all, they can all be connected. So what I mean by that is think of anxiety. Let's just talk about anxiety for a second. You can, you can have like anxious thoughts and worries in your mind, right? You can also have physical symptoms of anxiety. Like I could give you a drug uh, that I could give you speed or something that speeds up your heart, makes your hands sweat, and gives you the physical sensations of anxiety. Now, the physical sensations of anxiety are also very similar to the same sensations you get when you're excited, happy, or in love. But uh, they're also the same feelings you get, similar feelings you get when you're stressed or worried or anxious. And so I started to think to myself, you know, and because I'm in fitness, this was easy for me to, to put this together. I am going to make sure that I have the physical feelings of happiness. So I'm going to get that out of the way because the physical feelings of sad, depression, you know, physically feeling shitty can easily make you feel emotionally shitty. Like eating shitty food, not moving, not getting sunshine, not getting good sleep. Those will make you physically feel bad, which then can feed the whole emotional mental component. And then it becomes this whole cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Now you feel depressed emotionally on top of physically feeling depressed. Now you don't want to move even more and you feed into it and you get into this whole cycle. So number one is do all the things that are easy. And I don't mean easy in the sense that they're like, they're easy. Like you can do them. They're simple, like eat right, exercise, get sunshine, get good sleep, have good relationships with people. Make sure that your physical body, uh, which is the filter for a lot of stuff is feeling good. Mm -hmm. Then you, all you really have to deal with is the emotional mental component. And that is, was a much more difficult for me to deal with. And more recently, I've changed the question. So I used to ask myself, you know, how can I, like, what can I do to make sure I'm happy all the time? Like, how can I feel happy and content all the time? And I changed that because I think there's a mistake there. I don't think you're supposed to be happy all the time. I think mm-hmm. that that's false. I think that's I a myth. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you're supposed to be happy. I think what you're, what's the, I the think key. that's a mistake a lot of people have these days that, um, I mean, that's, that's the optimal state that everybody like emotionally, like they want to be in a happy state, right? Yeah. You, you can't be happy and, and, and joyful all the time. That's, that's a, first of all, if you're always joyful, then you're not joyful because right. Joy and happiness well, only, it's going to diminish the value. Well, of what joy. I mean by that, it, it only exists because you understand that it's a it's it's a state of mind that's in contrast to the opposite. Yeah, just like you know what the color you know you know what uh, black is because you know what light is, yeah. you know what happy is because you know what sad is. If you never knew sadness, you would never know happiness. So that's yeah. number one. Number two, to really feel I guess uh, good about your life, and it doesn't mean happy, but just feel good. The key, I think, at least what I'm starting to find is. I have to, as I'm looking for meaning. Yeah. What's the it's, meaning? It's all purpose based. That's I, it. Th- that's how I feel. Like, I, I feel like to achieve happiness, like, I'm always striving to feed into my purpose. And whether that's, you know, doing things for other people, which I know I get a reward from that as far as like the feeling of happy when I can see people around me that are happy and their emotional state is, is good. And, you know, that, that definitely will affect me personally. But the thing is, you know, there's times where people hurt and there's times where, you know, shit doesn't go your way. And, um, like you have to have resiliency and you have to be able to feel different feelings, but you, 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 the ability to be able to channel yourself and regroup and then, and then find your way back to happy. Like, I think that's the important, 
uh, a lesson in this is that there's a way to mentally um, recreate that and to, to get back to that, that optimal state. But um, I mean, it's like training, it's, it's like eating, it's like, it's like everything else. Like it, you can't just do the same thing. You can't operate on the same mode all the time. That's just not reality. Well, think about it this way. Like if you're, if you're just like focused, like I need to be happy all the time. That's my goal in life to be happy. Cause that's what people say, right? What's your goal in life to be happy. W- what happens when something bad happens? Because it will, n- life isn't perfect for anybody. I don't care. Even the richest people, the people who think I have everything, they've got challenges too, right? They're, they're, it's their challenges. They might not be their, your challenges, but it's theirs. What happens when you have a day where shit goes wrong? Well, now you're not happy and now you feel even worse because you're not happy. Like, sh- I shouldn't feel sad. I need to feel happy. How can I make myself feel happy? And you're constantly chasing this feeling that really is just a state of being a human. Now flip that. What if I was searching for meaning? Now when something bad happens, I lose mm-hmm. a loved one, I get sick, I get injured, I lose my job, you know, divorce, whatever. I understand I'm not going to be happy, but I'm looking for meaning in it. What, meaning in it, you know, what can I get yeah, lessons from this? And learning. Where, how can I grow from this? What can I learn from this? What mm-hmm. what does this mean for me? Look for meaning in things, and then you'll find that uh, life becomes uh, it just becomes different. It, it becomes less, I, I guess, less challenging is the word, but I don't even like to use that because it's always challenging, right? Yeah. So meaning, that's my answer. There you go. That was a lot of answer for somebody who said he wasn't very certain about it. I, you know, <laughs> it, it changes, right? Yeah. I. Um, it's a deep question. I'm going to have to disagree a little bit here. Um, that, first of all, this is this, I love this shit. I mean, I love talking about uh, ego, perspective, philosophy. Like, um, I think we can be happy. I think we can be happy all the time. And I think the key to that is perspective and finding the silver lining. I think that... Yeah, uh, so it's finding meaning, it sounds like. Yeah, it's perspective, right? Um, so, <laughs> Isn't that the same thing? Kind of. You you, you danced around yeah, it left yeah, or right silver and lining, dude. Uh, gave a lot of certainties in there. But uh, I definitely think that um, you can be happy. And I think that's something that um, I think we're always striving to, to do this. And I think it's very challenging. I think Katrina is amazing at this. It's part of why she makes an incredible partner for me because – I I still am very uh, emotional and let things uh, react to things that that seem devastating to me. Right, a death in the family. How can you find happiness in that, Adam? Like, how can you find happiness in so and so close to you dying, or how can you find happiness in losing a job, or you know, getting fired, or all these things that happen in life? And I absolutely think you can. I think in in everything that seems so daunting or stressful or heartbreaking to us. There is, there is good that can come of it. And I think learning to find that right away is the real challenge. All to, I, and I think some of us that, uh, that try to practice this or, or pay attention to this uh, ultimately find that. And let's, let's use your divorce for an example. Like you, you bring up that being like one of the most probably – you've been through probably one of the most challenging times you've ever been in the last year, right? I think you would agree with that. And the the only real difference between you today and you the day after that all happened is your mindset. Nothing physically. In fact, I bet you, if you really think about it, like it's a lot of things good have came of course. F- come from that. Of course. And we sometimes are blinded by, uh, by self and our ego. And when we get hit with these things, our ego starts to tell us like, oh my God, I failed as a father. Oh my God, I'm not good enough. Oh my God, like all these things. But in reality, it's like, what if you said like, oh my God, this is going to be an incredible opportunity. Oh my God, like my life is going to get so much better today. Oh my God. I, like what if you flipped it on its head when we had scenarios like that? And I think that's what we're all trying to get at and we're trying to get to that level. And I think it requires incredible perspective. I think it re- requires incredible self-awareness and you will always be battling your ego in this situation. And um, and ev- I think happiness is defined differently by everybody. I think yeah. that... Uh, your level of it is is really truly up to you. Like you could be the happiest per- person in life, and you do not need to do anything different but change your perspective. Mm-hmm. But you know, but it's okay to be sad. I think you know what I mean. Like it's okay to be angry. It's okay to have like of course these yeah. other emotions attached. Uh, it's just it's all on how you react, right? There's a, there's a reason why it, emo- those emotions exist. Right. And, and, you know, I tell you what, you know, we had Justin Wren in here and he talked about, you know, working with the um, with the pygmies. 
and how he was trying to explain his depression to them and how he wanted to commit suicide. And it was, it wasn't that they didn't understand him. Like they were thinking like, oh, you should be happy. That doesn't make sense. They didn't understand the concept. It was baffling to them. Mm -hmm. And I've actually read about this and heard about this many, many times at how in many of these, you know, what we consider primitive societies, they don't experience things like depression, at least not in our in our terminology, right? They don't experience these anxieties and depressions and and uh, and fears in the same ways that we do. And I, you know, you got to ask yourself why. I'm sure there's a modern living component. I'm sure there's a we focus on so many different things at what time, you know, type component. But I also think that there's this mentality that we've attached to modern Western life where we're constantly telling people to be happy. Like you have to fucking be happy. Everything's got to be great all the time rather than saying there's meaning in things and learn from things and grow from things. And I really do think, Adam, what you're saying is it really another way of saying that is when something bad happens, you look at it and you grow from it. And what you is the meaning behind it? You assess it and, you know, Absolutely. Like how are you going to react yeah, to it? Because yeah. I think when Perspective. you, when you yeah. do that, I think when you do that, um, it changes what that particular situation then means to you rather than this horrible thing just happened to me. Wow, I just got so sick that, you know, I wasn't able to work out for three months and I can't do any, or maybe even something devastating, like, you know, I lost a limb in a car accident or I'm paralyzed, like, and you and you like you could look at it and be like this horrible thing just happened to me, or you can say, okay, this horrible thing happened to me. What can I? How can I grow from this? And what does this mean for me? And how can I change things? It's interesting. There, there's uh, there's the story of uh, who, was it that guy that rock climber? He's the amputee that rock climbs. And yeah. You watch his interviews and it's like it's all about meaning for him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's all about like he doesn't look like he doesn't look at himself and think he's uh, at a disadvantage. He realizes there's a disadvantage in some cases, right? But he also says that it's an advantage in many other cases. And um, uh, you know, more and more when you're talking to these kinds of – because I, I don't think you should go to the person that has everything and ask them what the secret uh, to happiness is. I think you should go to the person who, in your eyes, has nothing but seems to be – Happy. Yeah, they seem to be content. I mean, that's to me the the pygmy story is a great example of what I was saying with perspective is the reason why they couldn't connect with him about why he would kill himself is because from from their perspective, every day is a struggle to live. Mm -hmm. So why would you ever think about taking a life that you're fighting for every day? So that's their perspective. And for him, he what's our perspective? I get up in the morning, I turn on my Instagram, and it's the guy with the fast car and the cool chicks and the bikinis and the throwing money up in the air and all the traveling all over the world. And like that's my perspective of what happiness is. And you How have strange to, is that, right? That's why I, I just did a post not that long ago about det- – and that's why I know sometimes my some of my posts don't get likes because it's in my head. And when I put it out, I'm not the best at fucking articulating what I'm trying to say, but – that that's what I meant by detachment and perspective is learning to detach yourself from your fucking little bubble and and have perspective on your life. And once you learn to do that, uh, I believe that happiness will follow. And I think that's what we're we're all trying to do. And we it's in our society, it's harder than ever because of all the distractions that we have with being present. And the pygmy was a perfect example of somebody. They don't have any of those distractions well, and they solely are focused on survival. Therefore, somebody that would take a lot, their own life seems so counterproductive to what they they thrive for every day. It's interesting because it's like you're, you base your own value and worth um, on, how, on other people. Mm-hmm. You look at other people and you compare and that will mm-hmm. tell you if you're doing, you know, that you'll think to yourself like, oh, I'm doing good or I'm doing bad based on these other people. But the reality is if I go back, if I just go back, you know, 100 years, 150 years and take a person from there and put them in the average, you know, put them in middle class well, America, yeah. they would be like, wow, this is utopia. Like, right. are you kidding me? You have heat and cool on demand. I have food that I can eat whenever I want. You I can be entertained by your phone in your hand like at they all would, times. They would like, be, it would be ridiculous. But, you know, yeah. here's, a, here's a question I want to ask you guys. What is your definition? Like, what do you, what does feeling happy mean? Because I think when people think happy, they think joy. Like, oh my God, I'm so happy. You know, I, I started kind of redefining it a little bit because that does exist too, right? Where you're mm-hmm. joyful, like, you know, oh, I just won the lottery. I mean, that would be fucking joy, right? For me, ah. it's like I, I feel filled. 
Yes, peace, right? Yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm like, yeah. I guess it's it's the the absence of fear and stress and anxiety. Like for me, it's like I feel filled because I know I've tapped in and I've honed in on on you know purpose and and meaning and and like I get up in the morning and I have other people counting on me and I'm, 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 you know, I'm hitting my marks and I'm doing things, you know, in, 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 in the right order. And, and things are kind of playing out the way that, you know, I feel like I, I wanted this to go and that, that fills me up. And then I get to, to higher highs and then I, I, I kind of level out, but um, yeah, joy is definitely, that's, I feel like joy should be more sporadic to where it's like, oh, wow. Like you just get really charged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the same for me. It's that feeling of like peace, you know, like you feel, I don't, content's the wrong word. I guess filled would probably be, well, the reason, a great word the reason why they're, they're all wrong words is because they're words, dude. They're made up fucking words. To explain a feeling. Exactly. <laughs> like, let's be fucking honest here. We could say, wrong talk, word, dude. We could, we could sit around this campfire all day yeah. and fucking talk about what's more right or who's more right. at the, and I think it's just, like I said, it's just, it's simpler than that. It's like, there's happiness in everything. Even the most challenging, worst day of your life, there's happiness within it. Well, you're you alive. Can, I mean, you, you could deduce it down to that. There's a million ways yeah. you can, right? And I think trying to put a label on it is the first mistake. I think just if you're dead. You're not happy. Right? Well, find the silver. Maybe, you are. maybe find, you are happy. Find yeah. the silver lining Damn in it. everything. Find the silver lining in everything. Detach yourself. Have better perspective. It's All funny right. too because uh, the they, statistics will show that people who are and people laugh whenever these these numbers come out. Men who are married live longer than men who are single. Uh, men who have children live longer than men who don't. And people say, well, how the fuck is that possible? Because <laughs> marriage and children like, is like some of the most- killing possible. me. Yeah. But I think it might be that. Mm -hmm. I think- and Because you have purpose. And people yeah. who go to but church- But you can create that without children yeah. and without a marriage if you know you how to, right? Exactly. Yeah, I just got to be more active about exactly. it. It happens for you when exactly. you do Exactly. And, and you know, people yeah. who go to church regularly mm -hmm. tend to live longer and be healthier too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they tapped into the meaning. One of the things, uh, in fact, when they do these big studies on the blue zones, uh, where you know areas where people live disproportionately longer than, than everywhere else in the world- one of the key things they find in common with all these areas of the world is that they have very good, close social networks and they all have a sense of purpose. That's literally maybe that's, what it says. Maybe that's a really good word for it, right? The p purpose. I like purpose there because I feel like in every bad situation, every good, there's you have a purpose within that, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, And you can throw me any devastating thing that could have possibly happened to you. And What's then the I, purpose of it? Yeah, what is the purpose of it? Where's your purpose? So, I, I mean, I think there's, I don't know, you could go around all day long on words with this shit, but I think- Purpose. I, I, think, I think too often people try and define it, try and seek for it when it's right in your fucking face. I mean, it, it's in it's happiness is in front of you every single day. You just choose to to accept it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, go to mindpumpmedia.com, enroll in thirty days of coaching. It's still free. So what happens here? Here's what happens every single day. You get an email with a subject, whether it's fat, protein, carbs, whether it's mobility, strength. It could be you know wellness, meditation. We cover that subject and then we link you to podcast episodes that we've covered that subject in detail and we timestamp them. So you know from minute five, you know, thirty seven to we don't minute mushroom stamp them. Fifteen <laughs> yeah. You get you you that's when we talk about that particular subject. It's absolutely free. You just go to mindpumpmedia.com and opt in. Also, find us on Instagram. When we answer these questions on these Q&A episodes, that's where we get the questions is from our Instagram. It's at Mind Pump Radio. Now, you can find my personal page at Mind Pump Sal. You can find Adam's personal page at Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump.